Good morning, Grace Point. Um, welcome. I'm glad that you're joining us this morning. I invite you that wherever you are worshiping from this morning, that you'll um, stand, uh, join with us as we declare the truth of who our God is, as we declare um, him, him praise and honor him for who he is and, and what he continues to do for us. So join us as we worship.
church. Heavenly Father, as we lift up those words, we rejoice that the very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that very same power dwells within each one of us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, as we lift up those words, as we even just hear those words being sung, I pray that they would never get old. I pray that they would never get dull, that they would never lose their meaning, that the very God who created the universe and who defeated the power of sin and death by sending his son has given us that same power through the Holy Spirit. So God, we praise you this morning. We rejoice in your amazing gift of the Holy Spirit, your amazing gift of grace that you so freely give that when we do things that grieve your heart, when we do things, uh, Father, that that we don't want to do at times, that you forgive us, that you give us grace. You pour your love out and you fill us with your power. So Father, this morning, we give you praise. We exalt your name. We just want the name of Jesus Christ to be lifted high in our lives, in our praises, and in all that we come in contact with. We would spread the gospel, the good news of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hi, church. I'm so glad you've chosen to gather with us online today. I'm Ryan. I'm the family ministries pastor here at Grace Point. So one of the things that many of us love about being the church, the body of believers, is that we normally can support each other, we can pray for each other, and we can love each other face to face. But even if those same ways of connecting aren't available right now, don't underestimate the ability to connect outside of the normal ways. We have really been blessed to stay connected in new ways with all of you and to see the ways you have loved on each other. I know I have loved talking on the phone with many of you just to see how you're doing and praying for you and your families. So we just want to make sure that you connect with us because we are the body, we are the church, and we want nothing more than to connect with you right now. So we do, we have a few ways that we want to do that right now and ways for you to connect. Uh, The first is that If you are new with us this week, if this is your first time joining us online or live, uh, we, uh, we want you to know that you can text CONNECT to the number on the screen at any time, and that will let us know how we can best connect with you. Another way to connect is to let us know if there's a way we could be praying for you. So you can text PRAY to the number on the screen, and we'll get right back to you. We want to be able to lift your requests and your burdens up to God. I also want to share with you that we have been so blessed by the many ways that you have given during this time uh, where we have have not been able to gather. In the midst of of the uncertainty of the world, of the economy and job changes, we have seen you continue to trust God with your money and your resources. And, And he promises to meet our needs when we trust him with our finances. You guys are just amazing. We have just You've blown our socks off, so thank you. And so as you continue to trust God in this area, we just want to remind you that there are several ways you can give. You can text GIVE to the number on the screen. You can mail in a check to the church, or you can go to the Grace Point website and give from there. And another way you can give is through our new Get and Give support page. And we want to take care of each other 
as Galatians ten, uh, Galatians six ten says. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So recently, we launched our Give or Get support page that allows us to offer help or resources, or to request help. So, just go to the website. You can click on the link and you can sign up, and then you can anonymously post what you can give, what you have to help somebody, or if you may need something. And this is just a great way for us to bear one another's burdens, to take care of each other as a household of faith, as the church. And finally, this is our last week for now for online gatherings only. So starting next week on Sunday, June 7th, we will be starting to regather as a church. So next Sunday at 8.45 and 11 a.m., we will have gatherings together at the building. We are so excited about being able to move forward with this, but we also want you to be prepared for the changes and that this is not going to be what a normal gathering has looked like in the past. First, just remember that there is no kids' ministry, so we won't have nursery or preschool or elementary programs. And this is really hard, especially for those of us who are with the kids every week, but under current guidelines, we feel this is the best way to proceed for now. We will have color, coloring pages and stuff for kids, but we completely understand if gathering at home is still a better option for your family. We also ask that you please stay in family groups when you come. I know that so many of us want hugs and we want our kids to play together and, and give high fives, but while we were in the building, we need to respect our local guidelines for social distancing. So as you come in, we will be going straight into the worship center and sitting in distance rows. This won't feel completely normal, but we know that you understand under the circumstances. And also, we won't have coffee available, but feel free to bring your own. And if your kids need snacks or something for the service, please feel free to bring those too. And don't forget that uh, even though we are gathering together, that we will still have online gatherings every week at 10 a.m., so I know there's many situations in your life that may not allow a live gathering right now for you or for your family. So know that we are still putting just as much effort into our online gathering. And for those of, uh, not just for those who aren't ready to gather, but those who are sick or high risk, or whatever your situation, we encourage you to take every precaution and still gather online with us. Because just because local guidelines say we can meet doesn't mean it's the right decision for everyone. So if you guys have any more questions or for ways you can serve during this time of regathering, please contact the church office. We continue to pray for all of you, and we love and we miss you guys. If you had unlimited resources, what would you do? Imagine with me for just a moment that you had all the power and all the resources of the world at your disposal. You could do anything that you want. What would you do? Would you perhaps do some good things? Stop world hunger, stop injustice, stop oppression, find a cure for COVID-19, find a cure for cancer. Maybe you'd save the forest, or if you're like me, you'd say, how do we put an end to mosquitoes in South Dakota and Minnesota? Maybe you're not so benevolent, and if you had all the resources at your disposal, you'd build your own empire. Maybe you'd just buy a car or a fleet of cars. Maybe you'd make a trip to Florida and buy a place down there and decide to retire in Florida. Speaking of Florida, or speaking of Florida reminds me of a, a joke I heard years ago that I want to share with you. Two farmers were given a million dollars each. One farmer took the money and said, I'm done farming, and he moved down to Florida and retired. When the other farmer was asked, what are you going to do with your million dollars? He said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to keep farming until I use all that money up. Farming's a tough, a tough, a tough career. Maybe you'd do something spiritual if you had all the resources at your disposal uh, that you could have. Maybe you would build a church or, or do something like support a missionary effort in a country. By the way, this is a great question to ask your kids sometime. 
Maybe you're at dinner or you're just out in the backyard hanging out. You could ask them, if you could do anything you want and money wasn't an issue, what would you do? That might give you a little glimpse into their heart and spur on some really, really good uh, conversation. This morning, the verses that we're about to read, uh, we will see that Jesus has all the power and resources of the world at his disposal. And it's not an imaginary moment like I just shared with you. Jesus knew the Father had put all power under him. He knew he had come from the Father and he was going back to the Father. In the verses we're about to read, the Lord does something kind of out of the box with this unlimited power that's at his disposal, and it's super revealing. The verses we're about to read presents to me one of the most profound concepts in all of the Bible. A couple weeks ago, I talked on this idea that really these messages that we're now in are centering on this promise of Jesus made in John chapter 10, verse 10, where he says, I've come to give you life and life to the full. And really, that's what we're looking into with today's message uh, once again. I'm going to read to you now John chapter 13, verses 1 through uh, 17. And basically, what we're going to see here is what Jesus does when he has all power and all the resources at his disposal in the world. Listen to verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now this means he loved them to the utmost. He loved them knowing that they would desert him in just a short amount of time. He even loved to the utmost the one who would betray him with a kiss. Jesus fully knows you and I, and he loves us to the utmost, even though he knows at times we're going to deny him and 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 do things that won't glorify his name. In this whole COVID-19 pandemic that we've been going through, I think a lot of us have just been trying to persevere through it and get through the other side. But I think if we're handling it right, one of the questions we're going to ask ourselves is, how do we love those around us to the utmost in the middle of this very difficult situation? Let's go to verse 2. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, you are going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Now this section of scripture, specifically verse 8, could mean a couple of things. It could mean that unless Jesus washed away Peter's sins by his death on the cross, Peter could have no relationship with him. We can see how that could mean that. But it could also mean this. Unless Peter was willing to submit to Jesus in this moment and allow him to wash his feet, Peter would not learn this vital lesson of humility and he would not understand that at the core of Jesus' nature was a servant heart. Let's jump back to verse 9. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. 
Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus, showing the extent of his love, knowing that all things were now under his power, that he had come from the Father and he was going back to the Father, washed his disciples' feet. Of all the things he could do with all that power and resource, he chose to wash his disciples' feet. Erwin McManus, a pastor and author, had some interesting insight about the scripture that we just read. Let me read some background information from him, and then he'll get into uh, his view of what we just read. McManus says that we have these three theological omnis that kind of drives us, that compels our worship of God. We have the omnipresence of God, the omniscience of God, the omnipotence of God, God being all-present, all-knowing, and all-powerful. And we tend to view God that way and, and, and worship God in, in light of these three theological omnis. But get this, and this is where McManus uh, gets into what we just read here in this uh, scripture from John. And yet, if that's what attracts you most to God, you may miss the beauty and the splendor of God of the Bible. Because God reveals a mystery of himself that I think is more difficult to comprehend and accept. That God himself is a servant. That at the very core of God, when you unwrap God, is that servant heart of God. It's that God in all his power could find nothing more godly to do than to tie a towel around himself, around his waist, and to wash his followers' feet. So we're in this section of the Gospel of John, right before the crucifixion of Jesus. In the last few messages from John, we've been addressing this question, how do I live life to the full? How do I find life in Jesus? How do I live it to the full? And we really want to have this revolutionary, robust, vibrant faith that spills over into every area of our life. Jesus knew the Father put everything under him. All things were under him. And that he had come from God. He was going back to God. And what does he do in light of all this resource and all this understanding? He bends down and in humility washes his disciples' feet. And here's what we have to realize, friends. At the core of Christ is a servant heart. At the core of Christ is a servant heart. Does that change your view of Jesus a little bit? When you think at the core of Jesus is a servant heart. Think about God for a moment. What words come to mind? Does servant rank high in that list? What do you call a God who no matter how much you've alienated yourself from him, no matter how much you've betrayed him, no matter how much you've hurt him or wounded him or ignored him, when you honestly cry out to him, he will come in an instant to meet your deepest needs. What do you call a God like that? What do you call someone who is willing to take care of you in your most basic needs and at your most basic level? Who says to you, don't worry about what you're going to wear. I clothe the lilies with beauty that's here today and gone tomorrow. If I do that, I'll take care of you. You'd call such a being a servant. Do this exercise with your spouse, with a friend, maybe with your kids. Sit down and look at each other and have this moment of exchanging some thoughts about each other that are positive. Say some things that come to mind when you think of the person sitting across the table from you and make sure it's, it's, it's a positive edifying experience. Perhaps if you're sitting with your spouse, you could say, well, when I think of you, the first thing that comes to my mind is that you're kind, you're gentle, you're thoughtful, you're caring, you're sacrificial. Um, do that same kind of exercise maybe with a friend or with your, your, your kids. Now let's do that exercise with Jesus. What comes to mind when you think of Jesus? I know for me, the first thing that pops into my mind is Savior. And then I think, man, he is Lord. He's king. He's this empathetic high priest. He's this sacrificial, you know, uh, self-giving person. He loves. He has this mercy that never ends. And 
He's perfect in his justice. And on and on I could go. In that mix, somewhere the term servant needs to surface. It needs to come forth. And I'm not trying to minimize God by saying that, you know, he's there to serve at our every whim and and beck. No, 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 no. He has a servant heart towards us, and he will do what's best for us. That's his very nature. And Christ shows the extent of his love, knowing all power is his. By doing this menial task, he demonstrates who he is. He washes the feet of his disciples, demonstrating that at the core of his very being is a servant heart. Foot washing was common in that time period, in that uh, era. Uh, they walked around in sandals. They, 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 their transportation was by foot. Their feet would get dusty. Usually it was a servant's job to wash uh, the feet of the guests. What's so unusual here is that the master, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, very God, a very God, is kneeling down before his disciple and washing their feet. He was doing that which the lowest servant would normally do. He's radically altering the value system of humanity. I mentioned a couple weeks ago in that particular message that really when you think of Christianity, it's more of a revolution than it is a religion. It it requires radical adherence and devotion and those kinds of things. And I loved how Pastor Aaron expanded on that last week and talked about this idea uh, that we're in this kind of revolutionary uh, kind of thing going on uh, with God that should affect how we think, how we behave, how we live out our lives. It should affect everything that we do uh, and everything that we desire. Now, some of us know this foot washing story all too well. It's lost its impact on us. But Really, this act by Jesus is so, so out of the box. The whole washing of feet thing is a real stretch for me. I don't know about you, but it's a real stretch for me. I can't speak to you, but I can speak to myself. And I know as far as my feet are concerned, I don't want someone else touching them. It just kind of makes me really uncomfortable. And we see Peter here. He's uncomfortable with this, and he's confused by it. I relate to Peter. I would have been uncomfortable. I would have been equally confused that Jesus was washing my feet. This is upside down thinking. It's not normal that the high ranking individual is stooping so low to do this menial task. And Peter says, Lord, at least be somewhat dignified. Wash my hands, wash my head too. And I don't know exactly why that would make it more dignified, but it seems to uh, make Peter feel better by saying that, by the way, I don't want to wash other people's feet either. Now, at least women, you do a job of making your feet look presentable. You scrape off the rough spots and you paint your toenails and you try to make your feet look pretty. But I want to tell you something. Most men, your feet are ugly. And I don't want to touch your feet. Most men don't want to touch other men's feet. At a few weddings that I've performed, there's been a foot washing ceremony. And it's always a a very moving moment as you'll have one... uh, sitting in a chair and the other one stooping down before them in this real posture of humility, bowing down and taking their foot and putting it gently into the water and washing it. And it's just this beautiful moment of declaration that I'm going to serve you and I'm going to just, you know, meet your needs and you're going to be utmost of uh, on my mind when it comes to uh, uh, my concerns and my thought process. And it's this beautiful moving moment. And I I tell you what, if you want to have a fun moment with your family, you could do a foot washing ceremony like that. Um, If you have teenagers, they're going to be extraordinarily uncomfortable with it. But sometimes that's fun to do that, just to stretch everybody. Uh, But let's take a break from that imagery and from that picture, as beautiful as it is. And let's get at the attitude that Christ is really promoting by this foot washing act. So I want to talk with you for a couple moments on a foot washing attitude that's really what I think Christ is getting at here. First of all, what he's saying is we have to be willing to take on menial tasks and accept a lesser role at times. 
we have to have that attitude that we can take on a menial task and accept a lesser role at the time, then be okay with that. I remember when I first became a pastor here at Grace Point. It wasn't back in the 1990s. And before that, I was a plant engineering manager at 3M. And so I had a whole bunch of people working for me in that plant. And um, I'm basically directing their work and all that. So then I take the job here. I'm an assistant. And I remember the first week, I tore down and put up walls like crazy downstairs in our basement. And I set up tables, and I tore down tables, set up chairs, I tore down chairs. And I remember thinking, wow, wow, is this how I'm going to spend my days as a pastor? Just kind of doing menial tasks? And is this what you want from me, God? And I remember God speaking to me saying, you know what, I'll raise you up in due season. Right now, you just serve me, and you serve me well. And don't think anything's lower than you or beneath you. You just do these things as unto me, and I'll worry about when you should be raised up. So foot washing attitude says, I'll take on a menial task. I'll accept the lesser role and give glory to God. Now, another foot washing attitude is this. I'm not insisting on my rights or my privileges. One of the concerns I have in the midst of this COVID-19 thing is kind of this bubbling argument that's going on a little bit by some about their rights and privileges being violated. And I'm not going to get into all that here or get into the political side of, of this whole thing. I'm not really concerned with that to much of a degree, to be honest with you. But here is what I want to say to you, beloved in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters who love Jesus Christ. If you're going to have a foot-washing attitude, you're going to be most concerned about others. You're not going to insist on your rights and your privileges. Now, I know there's a time to stand up and to say, you know, the government can't intrude on this. They can't, you know, there's a time to do that. But I say, by and large, where we should be at is in this whole thing is, God, what do you want me to do to serve others? And what rights do you want me to lay down? What privileges do you want me to lay down so that I can uh, have this kind of foot washing attitude? Third thing I see when it comes to a foot washing attitude is this. Meeting others' needs before I meet my own needs. That's truly the attitude that Jesus was trying to instill into his disciples. A fourth attitude I see is this. Doing a job no one else will do and doing that with cheerfulness. That's a foot-washing attitude. And here's the fifth and final one I just want to challenge you with. Focusing on results being achieved, not who is getting credit. That's foot-washing attitude. Focusing on the results, not who is getting credit. Listen, if you're a Christ follower, what matters is that Christ's kingdom is promoted, that his kingdom is expanding, and we have to rejoice when that's going on. We can't worry about who gets credit or who gets acknowledged. After all, we serve one king, that's Jesus. This is all about him and all about uh, the furtherance of his kingdom. Now, what's astonishing to me in this account, is that Jesus washed Judas Iscariot's feet. He knew he would betray him with a kiss. And we see by this act that Jesus, at the core of his being, has a servant attitude. After the foot washing, Jesus says to his disciples, you call me Lord, and you call me teacher, and rightly so. I am these things. He's affirming, I am God. You're right on. But at the core of my nature, is an attitude of service. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the son of man did not come to serve, but to be, or not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Christ goes on to say in what we read today, I give you an example for you to follow. So this brings us to point number two. We demonstrate Christ's likeness when we serve others. Jesus is radically um, altering the disciples' worldview here. Um, He's defining for us what it means to have life in him and have life to the full. We can easily begin to think, well, when Jesus promised me life to the full, this is about me getting a whole bunch of things that make my life a little bit better and maybe more comfortable and maybe more cool and maybe I see some neat spiritual things and all that kind of thing. But what he's really saying here uh, is life to the full means that I understand that when I serve God, Christ. And when that attitude is prevailing in my heart, I'm reflective of God and I'm now stepping into the full life that God has for me. Get this. 
The way up in the kingdom of God is by going down, by truly being humble. So just to hammer this point home biblically, let me give you two sub-points here that, that just really, really bring this thing home. Why we must serve. Jesus set this example for us. That's why we must serve. Jesus set this example for us. B, we're not greater than Jesus, therefore we too must serve. We're not greater than Jesus, therefore we too must serve. So Jesus, after washing the disciples' feet, says to them, do you understand what I've just done? Are you getting this concept down? What Jesus is bringing about here in the lives of the disciples and, of course, in our lives also, is what I call a monster paradigm shift. He's defining what it means to be great, to have life to the full, which brings us to point number three. Jesus has instituted a new paradigm. We do best when we embrace a servant attitude. We do best when we embrace a servant attitude. Basically, what the Lord Jesus was saying was, you're going to be blessed. You're going to enter into the full life that I've promised you if you'll truly embrace at the core of your being this servant attitude. I don't know if you understand what I mean by paradigm shift, so I want to give you an example of what a paradigm shift looks like. For years in cars, there was this mechanical braking system. The way you stop this big, huge mass of metal was by some pads rubbing on either a disc or a drum uh, to, to you know, provide friction uh, to slow the car down. And it was a hydraulic wonder of mechanical strength. These pads would push so hard on the disc or push so hard on the drum that they would just stop this car. And lots of heat would be uh, generated during this braking process. So at one point, somebody came up with this brilliant idea. We ought to harness all this wasted energy that's being exerted every time a car stops. And so they added into the, uh, you know, drive system of a car this uh, regenerative motor that sits on there. So it's a, it's, it, it, and, and what it does is that as you go to brake, it, it, it slows it down by its drag, creating uh, a magnetic, uh, or by its magnetic field and all that kind of stuff, making electricity that then produces uh, some electricity instead of heat, and that's partly how you slow the car down, and that electricity then goes to a battery, and then that's used to uh, drive the car that, with an electric motor. And it was like this paradigm shift. All this wasted energy was now being used instead of uh, uh, wasted and, and used to help the car uh, in its actual um, propulsion system. Uh, this whole regenerative braking thing, by the way, it wasn't something that the car industry came up with. It's been around forever. I remember 30 years ago putting regenerative motors on some of the big rollers at, at, that we used at 3M to, 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 to brake them. They could drive the roller and get it going, but also when you wanted to stop, you used the natural magnetic drag of the motor and all that stuff to stop the roller, you know, which the byproduct is you, you create current, you create uh, electricity. And someone had the brilliant idea of saying, oh, okay, let's just take that technology and let's put it into this application and we'll drastically change forever uh, how uh, the car operates. Fundamentally, what we got to understand is that Jesus created a new paradigm here. He linked serving as the pathway to living the blessed life. He linked, did you, get, did you hear that? He linked serving as the pathway to the blessed life. Now, serving was always an important part of the follower of God. It was always something that the people of God were called to do, to serve their God. But Jesus made it abundantly clear. You want to touch the heart of God? You want to experience true blessing in your life? Then serve. We serve when we lay our lives aside, when we keep thinking it's all about ourselves, when we will willingly sacrifice and suffer so that others might be blessed. And what happens in us is that feels right. It feels good. And we touch the heart of God. And 
That, my friends, is the full life. That is the blessing. So this is our conclusion, the blessing. Serving leads to a greater understanding of God. We touch the very heart of God. Therein lies the blessing of serving. Jesus linked that all together. He said you serve because it's a pathway to blessing. And really what the blessing is, is understanding the heart of God. I can't leave this topic till I talk with you for just a couple minutes on some practical tips on serving. Years ago, I read a Gallup poll that kind of alarmed me as a pastor. This was years ago. I don't even know if it applies anymore, but at least get us thinking uh, uh, together on this. This Gallup poll took a survey of, of uh, the American uh, church uh, member, so to speak, and it found that only 10% of them thought that serving was important and expressed any real interest in it. 40% expressed a casual interest in it and said, I don't really know how to do it. 50% had no interest whatsoever. What's alarming about that is 90% of the people surveyed in the American church basically said, I don't know much about serving and I don't know if it matters at all. Well, in light of what we covered today, do you see the problem with that? So what I want to do with you is talk for just a few moments on practical tips on serving. One, first practical tip, look for ways to serve. You are blessed not by what you know, but by what you do with what you know, as Jesus said. So we know we're supposed to serve, so we're going to be blessed if we look for ways to serve. By the way, we talk about this at Grace Point a lot, that God gives us grace so that we can bring grace into others' lives and bless them. Grace given to you finds its completion as you serve others with it. After dinner one Mother's Day, a mom was washing the dishes when the daughter walked in to the kitchen. Horrified to see her mother doing the dishes, she said, oh, mother, 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 you shouldn't be doing dishes on Mother's Day. And the mother began to get real pleased, thinking that the daughter was going to do dishes. She began to untie her apron, began to take her apron off. When the daughter completed her thought by saying this, they'll keep it till tomorrow. Oftentimes, friends, we blow right through an opportunity to serve. It's right there, right before us. We just have to open our eyes and step into it. For instance, as a church right now, we're doing Meals on Wheels. It's a great opportunity for us to serve those in our community who need a meal. It's very easy to do. You just go pick up the meals that are pre-made and you just drop them off at people's houses. No contact. It's very safe to do. If you have an interest in doing that kind of thing, you can go to our event page and our website and just sign up for it. I'd encourage you to do that. Simple way to serve. I think during this whole COVID-19 trial that we've gone through, one of the things that God's trying to do in us as the people of God, as the church, is to move us from a consumer mindset to a contributor mindset to a service mindset. I think that's one of the big shifts, one of the big things that God's trying to create in us as his people, to move away from what does the church do for me as to what can I do as part of the church for the culture that I find myself into. I, I think that's that. That is the good that God wants to work out of this. God works all things for good, we're told. And that good means conformity to Christ. And we look an awful lot like Jesus when we are willing to serve and to contribute. Second tip, I think, here, a practical tip is this. Realize that service is to be a lifestyle. It's not an activity. It's something that we're just supposed to engage in all the time. Jesus set the example for us. He tied the towel around himself. He served his disciples. He said, I've set this example for you. This is who you are to become. I love what Philippians 2 says about the Lord Jesus Christ. He being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be achieved, but he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. So realize this. Serving is at the heart of Jesus. It's not an activity. It's a lifestyle that we're to step into. And when we step into that, we experience the heart of God. We touch the heart of God. We experience the blessings of, of, of God. And we're experiencing that full life. So here's an application I want to end with in this message. Ask God to give you the grace to look at life through the lens of service. Just ask God, pray for that, be open to it, be on a hunt for it, and realize it's a lifestyle you to engage in, and then ask God to do this kind of a, a work in your life. And I, I, I think you'll step into the full life that God intends you to live. This is such an important topic. I'm going to get back to it again next week for a while. For now, we need to leave it. And I want to just encourage you, 
If you want to continue uh, to do some more study and talk on this, to go to our, our webpage, uh, go to the media section and go to the portion where you can get the note guide. And there will be a section called Together at Home, Discipling with Family and Friends. And I encourage you to use that with your family and friends and continue to talk on this subject matter. For now, would you bow your heads with me and let's close with a moment of prayer here. Lord God, I just love you and I praise you. I want to thank you uh, for this example of Christ. It's so powerful. It's so illuminating. Of all things, Jesus, you could have done. You had all power uh, under you. you. You were going back to the Father from whence you came. Of all the things you could have done, Lord, of you knelt before your disciples and you washed their feet, giving us an example that we too should follow, that we do best we thrive, we live life to the full when we are so full of your Holy Spirit, so full of your ways and your teachings, Lord Jesus, that our chief desire is to serve one another. Oh God, may that just be something we become, may it be part of our DNA. And I want to thank you, Lord Jesus. What I see here at Grace Point are so many people who illustrate this very kind of attitude. Praise you, Jesus, for them. They're such a blessing to the church and they're really, God, experiencing the blessed life in you. And that's what I want for all of us more than anything. Lord, we love you and we praise your most holy name this day. If anyone doesn't know Jesus that's listening to this today, I pray even now at this very moment, this quietness of this moment, that such a one would give their heart to you, Jesus. And just say, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord, be my Savior. And God, may they just step into some of the thoughts that I shared today and live a life in this entirely new paradigm. We love you, Jesus. We give you glory today. In your name, amen. Now I encourage you to stay and join with Pastor Jana and Pastor Kyle as they lead us in a closing moment of song. May it just minister to your heart. God bless you. I love you. And next week, remember, we're online still, but we're also meeting here in person. See our webpage for more details. Blessings to you.
this life bring suffering Lord I will remember your week. I pray that you go in that confidence that you are called, blessed, anointed uh, for the glory of God's name, uh, learning to serve him wherever you are in whatever capacity you can. Um, if you would like to be prayed over um, this morning, you can text into the number that's going to show up on the screen um, with the word prayer. And one of our um, pastors or someone on our connections team will connect with you and pray with you this morning. Um, and then lastly, just one final reminder that um, next week uh, we'll be into that, that transition period of now being able to meet in person for some services. So um, I encourage you to um, join us if you feel comfortable doing so or, or continuing to join us online um, if that's a better option for you and your family where you are um, in the midst of the season. Um, go this week feeling blessed. I'm encouraged. Uh, we love you and we will see you next week.